Hey everybody and welcome back to the Board Game Specialist. I am Melanie. And I'm Carla. And we are on episode 64. Now last week we said we were going to be doing our top 9 games better than Risk. But we got talking about the topics that we wanted to work on next. And we've decided to do next top nine games made by you, Rosenberg. And I completely skipped Risk. And since Carla is so much more better organized than I am, and she has both her lists ready, we're just going to skip ahead to the top nine games made by designer you, Rosenberg. And then we'll visit back the top nine games better than Risk next week. I'm glad one of us is organized, (laughs) Carla. (laughs) Well, just this time, I don't typically have two lists ahead. I don't I don't know what happened there. <laughs> oh, geez. Luckily, was, yeah. I did, though. She's like, okay, our top nine games of Risk, right? And I was like, no. No, that's not what I've written down at all. <laughs> oh, geez. Okay. Well, before we get into either list anyways, uh, what have you been playing, Carla? I got to play um, two of my newer games. Now, one of them I got at KefCon, and this was one that, um, since I was the auctioneer, I had to get one of my friends to bid for me, but it wasn't on the list. So as soon as I seen it come up, I just kind of gave them signals, like it was Cherry Nashi, like, <laughs> bid on this, bid on this. And it was new and shrink. Um, It was an older game that I've been looking for, and and they didn't know what signals I was giving them. They're just like, what, what? So they bid on it, and I got it for $10. Oh, nice. And that's Valparaiso. Now, this is a game that was made by the same designers of Rococo. And I remember when I backed, or I didn't back Rococo, it was a pre-order thing. It wasn't on Kickstarter, but you had to pre-order it, and I didn't get it for like almost a year. And I remember looking at the designers and then seeing this older game, And it was very hard to find. I don't think you could, I think it's out of print. But when this, when I saw this in the auction, I'm like, oh, I got to try this. Maybe I'll get it for cheap. Well, I did not think I'd get it for $10, new and shrink. So finally, I mean, Kefcon was in the fall. We finally got this to the table now in the spring. And it was good. It's a really quick um, programming game, which I don't think I have a single programming game. I've, the only one I can think of that I've played is um, Colt Express, I think it's called. Okay. Um, kind of like Colt, Robo Rally Colt Express, then. I think. Would that be a I guess. I've game? never played that one either. Oh. But you have to like um, program the cards you're going to play that round. So right. you have a hand of cards. Everyone has that starts with the same hand of cards. And then you put them in the slots. And you have um, four slots to begin with. And then you put them in order. And so then when... You start the round, the first player will use their first action. Now, the cool thing is you can bypass that and use your second action, but you have to pay money. So the first one is free, obviously, but if you want to do the next action, you'd have to move on. Now, I should explain what the game is. It's um, a a Euro game, of course, and you are in the, the vicinity of Valparaiso, and then there's other places around it. And you start with your um, boat in that area, as well as a merchant. And what you're trying to do is move around to different places and visit markets, um, build houses. You're trying to trade overseas, which is basically getting more cards in your hand that will give you more actions or better actions. Now, each of the actions do different things, but they also have something on the bottom of the card. So if if something happens that you can't do that action or you don't want to, you can always take the bottom part, which is either money or more resources or whatnot. But it's it's quite neat and it's such a quick game. Like I'm sure, you know, we just learned it and played it. And it, I think it was an hour and a half. I'm sure you could play this in under an hour. But you take turns doing an action and you will either move your merchant, you will either... Um, trade up these markets and these markets will continually um, change. So they have these little tiles on each market, about maybe 10 of them in a row. And if you are going to exchange at that market, then you will move that um, type of trade off the market and you'll grab a new one and put it at the top and slide them all down. So you might have different people already moved there. So I might be at a market and somebody else, but whoever is the first one to do it is going to do the, the bottom tile. So that's where the programming is interesting because you think you might have a whole plan, but 
um, once you've moved your person there, somebody might already be there and take that action. And then the one that comes up is not one you wanted to do. You also have to pay if other people are at the uh, market already. You um, can build houses in different markets, but if you do build in Valparaiso, that'll give you income at the end of the round. So you can either get money or different resources. Um, when you want to trade overseas, which is getting new cards, you need to pay certain types of resources. And the resources have to be in your cargo. So there's a spot um, that you will put all your resources first, and then you have to take an action to actually move them into your cargo. So it's just a few simple actions, like maybe five, but then some of the cards will give you better, uh, more improved actions. And that's really all it is, is just a programming, um, you know, resource transformation that you're just trying to get the most points. You can do it by different ways at the end, like money is points, um, just straight points is points, obviously. And then um, your resources, you can turn back into points. And it's just a way to find out figure out how you can get the the maximum. It's really cool and I'm glad I got it. And that one will stay in my collection is one of my older Euros that I love. Another one um, I have bought recently that I had my eye on for a while. And these typically aren't my type of games, but I'm really getting into them. And it's more of like a narrative. Um, I'm not going to say RPG because you don't really, you do have roles, but yeah, I don't think, I wouldn't say you're role playing in it. And it's called The Adventures of Robin Hood. And this one is a cooperative oh. game and it's very different. It's, uh, you have, you start out with this map. There's barely any rules, which is awesome. Like you just literally read how you move on in this game and then you start the game and you have this little novel that um, has these little ribbons in them that you will depending on what scenario you're doing, you'll start at. And it's kind of a choose your own adventure, basically. But you have um, an objective at the beginning of each game, and you have to complete that before um, these certain timers run out and visit different places and find things and uh, escape places. And it's quite neat. It's not, you're not really collecting a lot of things. You do collect some things like um, swords or rope or things that'll help you move around in the village. But so far, we've only done one scenario. Um, no, I should, I should say we've done two. We lost the second one, so we'll have to go back and revisit it. It won't be the exact same because the second one will be like people in the village will do different things. So it's not like you can just go back and know what, where things are and what to do. So it'll be interesting when we visit that again, but it's a cooperative kind of legacy game with, I think only seven actual scenarios, but there is an expansion coming. So we'll see how fun this is and if we really enjoy it enough to get the second part of it. But what about you? What have you been playing? Well, um, Ashley came over and we played her prototype of search, which is, it was really awesome. interesting. So search is you get a puppy and you have to train them to become search and rescue dogs. So, and I, I really enjoyed how thematic it was too, because it's like a dag, uh, dag, bag building game, and you have like each dog has certain abilities. So there's all sorts of abilities, and you have one of each, but different breeds will have more of a certain ability. So you have like a couple more of a certain colored ability in your bag that you start off with. And you're going to be kind of pulling these out and spending them to go and activate or a certain training that you'd be doing with your dog. So it's like, okay, well, I'm going to use his agility and this and this, and then I'm going to go on the agility track here. And then you gain things when you go. So you can gain where you get extra draws from the bag so you can pull extra things out of the bag or you can get gear it's like wait well i've got a leash now so you kind of give you extra control of what you can do in uh in trainings and stuff and then there's the main training area in the middle and dogs are very much motivated by food so you need to have a sausage token in order to be able to train <laughs> there um because that's how you motivate them to go through this training so you got to collect the sausage you could collect also like a toy a ball and because as you play you'll be drawing sometimes distractions it's kind of like squirrel um and you have to be able to kind of regain control of your dog 
either by distracting him with a different toy, so you would discard one of your toy token, or if he's very loyal, or, you know, like you could discard some abilities that would allow him to kind of regain control and and walk away from that distraction, which I thought was so thematic to training a dog. Um, it was so neat, very interesting. I mean, it is still in its prototype form, uh, but it felt like a solid game, so I really enjoyed that one. You've yeah, I've been waiting before. for you to be able to play this. Yes, yeah. I played a couple times. Waiting for you to be able to play it so we could talk about it. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, the dogs in it are very neat. Did you happen to notice the Australian Shepherd in the game? That's the one I had. Ah, that's my won. Aussie. <laughs> oh, that's cute. Well, it said Oz on there, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah so it's neat. Like you have the different um, dog, the different breeds. And then you have like, because it's worker placement. And then she had like these 3D printed dog silhouette that you would place on the board. And then you have tokens with the dog that shows what you've activated and collected. Like it was, it was really well thought out. This was a neat game. Yeah. So There's I was like, really hey, you need to publish mechanics. this soon or make a few more prototypes so we can have our own copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I think it's a yeah. lot of work. The prototype. So. <laughs> She's been spending a lot of time on it. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I think, well, I, I'm 99% sure you'll be able to play this at Falcon. I think she'll have yes. it as a prototype there. Yeah. Um, it's worth a, tr- oh, it's worth a play. It's really neat. Yeah. It's cool. Awesome. Yeah. And then I decided to reorganize my board games. So, and then the main reason for that is I have my games. I had it set up kind of like almost by player count and genre. That's how I had set them up when we moved here last summer. But I've purchased a lot of games since. And I have some Dominion that are spread out. And I have my, uh, a couple of similar games that all spread out. And then I'm looking at my shelves and I see like tall, small, medium, tall, small, and it's just like all bounce and it, it, it was bugging me. So I was like, okay, I think I'm going to reorganize them by size so that when all the games the same size are together and you look across the, the shelves and you have like that nice straight line and I don't know why I care, but apparently I really do. And I've been talking about reorganizing them probably for about a month. And Lee, my partner, is like, just go ahead and do it. And I was like, oh, but it's going to be a big job. He's like, yeah, well, you've been talking about it for a month. Go ahead and do it. And I'm st- I'm not done. It's been four or five days now. And I'm still not done organizing them. Now, I do have 620 games. So I started with the small game. I pulled everything off my small shelf. And I put them all side by side. And then I adjust them. So And it took my entire gaming table. And then I started putting them back so that they're all the same size together. And so I've done my small, my like pivoting one that has the small games. And then I have like a three by four and those are all done with the other smaller games. And then I had a five by five Calyx that's all done as well. And then I have two more five by five Calyx and two one by four Calyx that are still not quite done. (laughs) It's, It's ridiculous. It's like, so I got games on my table. I've got games on the floor. I've got holes in my cubbies. And then my kid came down and he was helping me organize the size a little bit yesterday. And he's like, these aren't going to fit back on there. And I was like, well, they came from there. So yeah, they should fit. But, oh, so that's taken away from game playing time because some idiot decided we should reorganize the game. Games. And I got started and I took a picture and I sent it to you guys, to our gaming group. Um, and I was like, hey, one of you guys should have stopped me. <laughs> um, but yeah, Ashley came over and she did help quite a bit. So that was good. But yeah, there's still so much. it is not a small job to reorganize the games. And this is the largest my collection has been when I've decided to do that. Let's pull them all down and put them all back and organize them in some form or fashion. And Lee's like, I'll make you a spreadsheet so you can find everything afterwards because it's by size. Oh, wow. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. (laughs) Because by size is ridiculous. You know, it's like, oh, let's play Codename. Do you have Codename? 
You betcha I do. What size is it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So, was this the right choice? I am not convinced. But it's happened. So, and I got to finish this. I'm hoping to finish it today. And then see see how it looks. But you know what? Like the ones that are done and I'm looking, I was like, see that nice straight line? And you got the straight line all across and all the games are all the same size. And I don't know. I love it. But, but it came out of cost. It's, it's, it's been taking a while. <laughs> all right. So let's get into our top nine. Um, and we're doing our top nine games created by you, Rosenberg. So I anticipate a fair bit of crossovers. Although mm -hmm. I think the ones I prefer from him might be different than the ones you prefer from him as well. But let's get started. So Carla, what's your number nine? Well, before I talk about my number nine, I just have to say this was a very, very hard, um, not a hard list because I have so many of his games and love so many games, but it's very hard to compare two games that I love and just choose one. Like how I always do this, and I think you do on Pub Meeple as well, yeah. where you list all the games that you want, and then they just give you a mish mishmash of comparing them. And I'm not sure how they figure it out, but <laughs> you can kind of tell by the end when your favorite keeps coming up and against everything, and you're like, nope, this one's still, 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 still. And then all of a sudden, <gasps> I don't know which one I like better. So it was really hard. So, um, Above my top nine, there was a couple that I just can't believe they're above nine. And that was um, Le Havre and New York Zoo. I love both of these games so much. Um, totally different game. One's a, a heavier Euro. Basically, you know, you're trading resources, you know, collecting resources, turning them into something else like most of his games. And the other one is a tile lane game. So he kind of has two basic types of games one's tile laying and the other one is like a farming type of game now he does have like card games and whatnot as well but those i would say are as kind of two major lines of games so these two are from each of the lines and i i can't believe they're number 10 but it's because he has so many good games so my number nine is caverna now this one was made in 2013 this i will say is like a a sequel to Agricola. So Agricola was his basic farming game that he first came out with. And then this was made quite a few years later. Um, some people think improved. Some people still prefer Agricola. But this one is you are cave farmers. And you are um, farming animals, um, growing crops. But you're also um, cave dwelling. And you are building things in your cave. You are... Um, digging for rubies, building ruby mines, um, building rooms in your cave, because that is actually where you live, <laughs> and all kinds of things. And Caverna adds that you can build strength. And once you build strength to each of your little people, then they will be able to um, search and find more and better things. So it adds quite a bit to it. Um, it doesn't have the card play that Agricola does, where you can um, play cards that will kind of build a little engine if you're lucky enough to get the right combination of cards. But Caverna is more just the a huge worker placement game. There's tons and tons of places to go to. Depending on player count, it changes. But it's it's such a, a unique, um, well, a unique to to other games. I mean, it is, it has a similarity to Agricola. It's a little more forgiving with the food. Uwe Rosenberg likes to, um, people call it punishing, but he always likes to be able to feed his people. So, and some people hate that. They absolutely hate it. It is quite difficult in Agricola. Um, in Caverna, it's quite a bit easier to do, to find food, to get food, to turn things into food. Um, you can use all kinds of different things, but it's still, you still have to have that food or you're going to get these terrible tokens that are going to give you negative points at the end of the game. So you always want to be able to feed your people, but it's, it's such a good game. I love it. And that's my number nine, Caverna. Nice. I've never played Caverna. 
So I can't, really? I can't say. Yeah, I know there's a few. I was going mm. through his list and I was like, oh, I heard such good things, but I haven't played it yet. So Caverna <laughs> is one of my, I need to try. I don't own it. So I've, I've never played it, but I, I hear great things. My number nine is Patchwork. So this one was created in 2019, uh, 2014, sorry. And Patchwork is a game that I, like, I had great, th- heard great things about it. So I purchased it for my brother for Christmas. And then I had purchased it for my friend for Christmas. And then I purchased it to my sister for some sort of holidays or birthdays or something. And I still, to this point, had not purchased this for myself. I have it now. So I don't know if I finally bought my own copy or whatever, but I do have it now. But in this game, you are building a quilt and you have all these patches of fabric that are all put around in a big circle and you're going to be purchasing these pieces and they'll have a price on them. So some are more expensive, some are cheaper. There's also a time like a time price to it. So if it's like, hey, I'm gonna get this one, it's gonna cost me two buttons because the buttons is the currency in here and three times. So then you have to move your, your, I guess your marker up three spaces. And then you put this in your, on your tableau. And there are all these different shapes and then you try to squeeze them in together because a quilt is better if there's no holes in it. So you're trying to create a quilt as, you know, solidly created as possible. Um, And then if the piece has a button, then every time you're going to collect reason or the currency, then you collect all the buttons that you have on your quilt. So you have more purchasing power. If you ever run out of buttons and you can't, then you can just move your marker ahead to one spot in front of the previous player. And the number of spaces you move forward is how many buttons you get. So it's good because you get buttons. Is bad because you're wasting a lot of times that could be so it's kind of an interesting balance of like the pieces you'll pick what time you're spending what buttons you're spending and so on I mean the first time because at the end each holes in your quilt are negative points buttons are positive points and you kind of tally up your score the first three times I've played my score was in the hole, like in the negative. I I had way more holes than I had points for. And it's just one of those games that like, and then the first time I scored a positive, I was like, oh my God, (laughs) you know, so, but it's an interesting game. It's two player only game. And they've created a lot of different variation of this one. So they have like an Americana version. They have like a, Halloween version, a Christmas version. Um, I've only have the base one. Um, and I think they all play the same, I think, but they just all have neat artwork to it. So it's a great game. So that's my number nine patchwork. Yes, it's an awesome game. I love it. My number eight is Glass Road made in 2013. This one is one of his more unique games as well, because it uses a glass or a a wheel, a resource wheel, instead of collecting resources and paying them. You're just using this wheel. And it's really cool because you start with um, each resource on a certain spot of the wheel. He has used this in in a few of his other games or Labora. And um, <clears throat> a kind of a similar one to the Inland Port, the two-player version. It's a little bit different, but So you put, you have these, start these resources on different spots in the wheel. And when you gain one, you will move it up, but you may lose another kind. Um, You may also gain another kind, but it's interesting because um, what you're doing is you are um, on the glass road and you're trying to build all these buildings and of course get as many points as possible. But you have, you start with this player board that has um, some different, um, swamps on it and um, farmland that or and trees that you need to clear in order to use that land to build more buildings. It's also a very quick game, but in order to build the buildings, you need resources. And sometimes trying to get those resources 
is tricky because how you do that is you each have a hand of cards and you have the you have the same hand of cards as everybody else. It's quite a, a large hand. And you choose, depending on the round, a certain amount of cards that you're going to play. It's not programming because you can play them, you know, you can choose each turn which one you're going to play. But so you choose, I can't remember how many now, maybe I'll, I'll just say six, and then you put the rest of the cards down. So you have this hand of cards and then you take turns and you'll play one card. Now, if I play a card that somebody else has, they have to lay theirs down on top and they will only get to do, or you will all only get to do one action. If nobody has this card, I'll get to do both actions on this card. So it's a bit of a, a gamble too, because you're like playing it going, oh, I hope nobody has it because I really wanted to do both these actions. I wanted to build something and I wanted to collect a bunch of wood or something. And then you have spots on your board that you can play um, a card that somebody else has played. Now, if you happen to have all the cards that nobody has, you're going to get to play them all. But once you have played so many cards that someone else has, you're done. So it's quite risky. You kind of want to look around to see what other people are playing or what they need so that you would maybe do different things in order to be able to play them out. Two player game, it's a little bit easier to read because you can kind of tell maybe what they would be doing or maybe what they would want. Um, it's, it's really unique and interesting because that's a whole other mechanic in the game that you have to worry about, not just planning what you're doing and playing the actions that you want to do. You may not be able to do them all. So the, with the wheel and the card play, it's such a cool game. It plays really fast. I would say less than 45 minutes. It's an awesome solo game because one thing with Uwe games, most of his if not all of his solo game uh, plays of these, you are basically just playing the game and you don't have to have a um, AI or another deck. You basically just play your game and then you just have to like remove some certain tiles or certain things at the end of the round or at the beginning of the round and that's it. So you're just basically playing your turn the whole time. Um, and so it's super quick. You could play a solo game of this in 20 minutes easy. You usually end up playing a few, but it's a really good solo game, but also a good multiplayer game. And that's my number eight, Glass Road. I haven't played that one either. Yeah, it's good. It's really good. Nice. My number eight is another one, small one of his, and that's Framework created in 2022. So with Framework, you have all these tiles, and the tile has probably a frame around it could have one two three frames and the frame is kind of a different material so it could be a wooden frame or maybe it's like a golden frame or you'd have like a metal frame or you got like a leafy vine frame or something and in the middle of that sometimes they're blank sometimes they have a number in a circle that matches the colors of the frames and the goal is to put these tiles down. And if you have one that has like a three in a yellow circle, then you're trying to get this particular tile connected to a cluster or multiple clusters of frame that would have the yellow frame uh, to a total of three. So when you kind of meet that requirement, then you could put one of your token on top of that number, you fulfill that order. And you know, like as you continue playing and adding on to the tableau in front of you, you'll get more tiles that you add on. It'll be like, okay, well, this one wants to have, be touching five different wooden frames. And it's like, okay, well, it's touching two over here and one over there. So maybe I can kind of grow this cluster here. And then, you know, and it all intermingles because the more you add on, the different clusters you're going to create, but then the more requests you come up. And this is a race game because you're trying to get this, these tiles put out and have all of your tokens fulfilled before somebody else gets to complete theirs. Um, I've played this the first time. Well, actually, I played a different game the first time, and I wanted it. I couldn't find it, so I got this one because it was similar. And I've played it a few times here at home with Lee and with Lily, and it just goes over well. Uh, so well, such an easy game to teach. It's an easy game to play. But you got some interesting decisions because you got, I think it's four or five tiles that you got to pick from. It's like, okay. And then you're looking. It's like, okay, I really want those frames. Like, please, nobody take it. Please, nobody take it. And then Lily takes it. It's like, darn it. Okay, 
what's next? Like, what, what else can I do? Or, you know, like it's, it has, it's very interesting in what you're trying to decide on what you're going to concentrate on and put together. And it's totally at the mercy of what the tiles are and what you see as well. But I just really enjoy that one. So that's my number eight framework. Yeah, I love this one as well. It's an awesome one. All right, my number seven is A Feast for Odin made in 2016. Now, I know you're not a big fan of this game, <laughs> but you have only played it one time. The first time you play this game, it is probably Brutal. not the best. <laughs> you almost have to play it a few times because you almost... This game is a, a Viking-themed game where you have... It feels like a hundred worker place and spots you can go to. And what you're yeah. doing is you are getting boats, you are getting resources, you are... Um, whaling you were do you are plundering you were doing all kinds of things trading in resources for other ones getting farm animals you might be getting milk from these animals there's so many things you can do and then there's also an expansion which adds even more but um it's it's so awesome also what you're doing is you have this board in front of you which is this huge board with all these it's a grid and it has all these negative numbers on it and you're trying to fill that board completely because if whatever you don't fill you're going to end up with those negative points also on there are these some little icons that will give you free resources if you can surround them completely not cover them up so that's the tricky part you are playing like a another little polyominal game here with trying to put tiles on there um, surrounding these resources but also covering up as much board as you can because if you can build up a square from the bottom left diagonal up to the top however big of a square you can build that is what your income in dollars is going to be each round money is important because you need it to buy some sometimes just resources um you need it to i think it's for boats as well for all kinds of things you also have to feed your um vikings and how you do that is so cool is getting some of the resources the resources are mostly tiles some of them are actual wooden resources but the tiles they will be in all different kinds of shapes and you have this little um, feast table that you have to put your you have to line up your food on and you have to make sure that you get the length of how many you're feeding and it's really cool because you can use coins there you can use um I think you can even use ore up there, maybe not, but there's different things. And if you use the same type of food, so if I have this big long fish that I can put there and then I use another fish, well, I can't put it the length way. I have to put it the tall way. So it really screws you up. So you want to have different kinds of food up there to feed them. It's such a unique game, but a lot of people had said that the polyominal part of it was that was his like masterpiece of the reason why he built all these smaller polyominal games to put into this game. There's so much going on in this game. Could talk about this for a long time, but I just love it. It is it doesn't get to the table often. It's such a huge setup. Takes up your whole table just for two people. I don't even know if I've ever played it with more than two, but it's awesome and this is one where the expansion makes it even better. It is I don't would never play without the expansion again. But that's my number um, seven, A Feast for Odin. Nice. Yeah, I've played this the one time. The learn <laughs> was huge, the gameplay. I mean, and it wasn't... Yeah. The whole thing with it is, like, it wasn't bad. It was interesting decisions. There was a lot going on. But the player board starts with, like, 100 negative points that you try to cover up so you don't end mm -hmm. up with a negative score. And then you're playing, and then there'll be times when you play, it's a big game, it's a long game, but it flies by. And this one, for me, did not fly by. And we're playing <laughs> and kind of looking at the times, like, how long have we been at it? It's like, how much longer do we have to go? And just because it had that really, almost it felt like a chore, I was like, okay, I don't need to play this again. <laughs> and I, I hear all the time, the more you play, the better it is. And I I believe that, but it's just like, oh, it's that, very that, long. Game. Yeah, yeah, that one. It's just like it just 
it wasn't one of those like, hey, it was big, it was a lot of stuff to, but it just flew by, and I, I like, I really enjoyed myself. I, 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 I didn't get that feeling playing this one, so unfortunately, <laughs> and it's like, well, the more you play, the better it gets. Yeah, that's good for them. <laughs> you know, I don't think this is one that I'm going to go out of my way to try and revisit. I've got so many other games I need to get played anyway, so it's not one right. that I'm going to go out of my way to revisit. There is other games in here that I loved of his. Of his. There's one on my list that's similar to that one that I would rather play and get instead, so we'll get to that. Now, my number seven is not that game. My number seven is another smaller tile lane game and that's Nova Luna. So we played Nova Luna for the first time uh at Gobfest last year with you right. and I loved it. It was so good. And then I was looking for it and I couldn't find it. That's when I bought framework. And then I found Nova Luna since so I bought Nova Luna as well. Um and it's interesting so you have all these tiles. Um that you're adding, like framework, you're adding them to your board and you're creating these clusters. Now, the first time I played, I didn't understand it was clusters you were trying to create. I thought the tile had to touch what was around. So I, I wasn't making a very smart decision the first time. Um, but it's it has more of a patchwork in the way of how you select the pieces because you have this piece in the middle and all the tiles go around now all of them some of them and then as they get drawn then you can go and refill them and then new tiles come out but you have access to like the next few tiles from where you're at and they have as well kind of a time price that's like, okay well take this one it moves your guys so forward so much and it's one of like whoever's in the last position gets to pick next so if you present oh this is a great tile I'll take this one Oh, but it moves me forward so much. I'm going to be a while before I, t but it's such a good time I'm taking it anyways. You know, and you take it and you add it and, and, but it plays very much like framework where you're trying to accomplish all these orders, I guess. And the first one to put your token, uh, your last token on your board and it's the race finishes the game and, and wins. Now, the first time I played, Carla's like, okay, I'm done. I'm like, what? I haven't even put half my tokens yet. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Um, and I've played it again since. And it's just, it was, like, even though I lost so much, I was like, okay, this is, this is neat. I'm going to want this game. So couldn't find it right away. I found it now. So that's my number seven, Nova Luna, which was published in 2019. Yes. I love that game too. All right, my number five is one of his new ones, oh, wait, and that's did you do number six? and made in. Tw oh, sorry. Oops, <laughs> my six. My six is a crossover. It's a crossover that you talked about already, and that's Patchwork. Love Patchwork. It's uh, the polyomino Tetris game that I I loved Tetris as a kid. I don't know how, what is so satisfying about filling your board, but. There is something that uh, I just love it. And uh, yeah, I, I won't talk about much. I might as well just jump into my five and then yeah. I'll go to yours because I already said it. But yeah, so my number five is Adawa, that his new uh, game about bats in um, Ghana. And it's it's a, a unique game as well. It's different from what he usually does. There's still the farming theme. You are trying to ho actually house bats. And the theory behind it is people there believed, some people believed that they were evil and they brought on, um, they were like the devil if there was bats in their area and they were killing their crops and doing things, which in fact was the opposite. They would come and eat their fruit, but um, they would also move around and then drop their um, droppings and would actually start new crops in different areas. So now if they're trained people, they will, they know that they're actually a good thing and it's um, beneficial to have bats. So you have a, like a little board that you are trying to build tiles around, which are tiles I'll say, but they're actually cards or these big cards that you will place around your starting one and trying to um, acquire 
get the bats to come to you. You're trying to put animals on them because you also need to feed your people. You're trying to um, in increase your population so you will have more people and more families. You also want to try and train those families because if they're untrained, then they still think the bats are evil although they are can eat them <laughs> when you do have to feed the people if you have untrained people you can feed them bats but you can't feed the trained people bats which is is kind of it's kind of silly but i guess it makes sense cuz they were eating them the people who believed they were bad and how it works is you start with like that board but on top you have all the resources set out on your own. So you have your own little market. Everybody has their own little market kind of thing. And so anytime you gain a, an animal, it comes off that board onto your, your little player tiles. And then if you eat that animal, it'll go back up there. But how you do your income at the end of the round is you start at the top. So then if you, um, you'll see what the animals are at top and you'll have an income and it'll give you say, um, a tree or something, and then you will grab a tree from that market. Well, then that opens up more income. So you, you're trying to build kind of an engine as well as that as you're doing income, you're still getting more and more and more and more. It, it's such a cool game. You have to, there, it's a worker placement game as well. There's all these different spots you can go to and you can't go to the same spot. This is before you do your income. You can gain more terrain cards. You can gain more villages, which can fill more people. There's all kinds of things going on. I've only got to play this once so far, and that might be why it's still high on my list because I want to play it again very soon. But I know that, like I already know that I, I love this game and it will stay in my collection. Like all his other games that I have, I have never thought about or will ever sell one of his games that I have, but that's my number five, Attaway. So you do nice. your next two now. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, that one looks good. I've seen it. it's it's late or it's a new one, so I haven't played that one yet. Yeah, twenty twenty two. Yeah, it yeah. looks really good. All right, mm -hmm. my number five. No, my number six. So I have five and six, and actually six. It works well to put <laughs> them together. So my number six is yeah. Bonanza: The Duel. I love you Rosenberg's card game because I find they're so well, they work so well. So Bonanza the Duel is the two-player version of Bonanza. And Bonanza is a negotiation game. And how is that going to work out of two players? And with Bonanza mm -hmm. Duel, they figured out a way to make that work. So you have your cards and then you have a set of cards in front of you of all like these different things that's available. And you the way that it works is you make an offer so you would slide a card towards the other player says okay i'm offering you <laughs> this and then they can accept or counter offers like mm, no but i'll offer you that one and you can bluff and offer something you don't even have uh in hopes to get a different offer and then they can accept it's like darn it i don't actually have that and then you kind of it kind of it, it creates a negative thing for you, right? You don't want to get caught in a bluff, ideally. Um, but it's such a neat way to make Bonanza work as a two-player game that it's it's a lot of fun. Um, the first time I played this one was with my brother at uh, Falcon. Jeez, 2020, uh, 2018, I think it was. like So it was a long time ago. And... It was it was so good because Bonanza the Duel was created in 2016. I forgot to mention that. Um, and it's just the fact that they could take the Bonanza game, turn it into a two-player game, being that it's a negotiation game, and salvage that negotiation aspect of it. I'm super impressed. And it's so good. Carla, have you played Bonanza the Duel? Yes, I love it. And nobody I've played loves it. So <laughs> me and you'll have to play this because yeah, I absolutely will. love it. Okay, so that was my number six, Bonanza Duel. My number five is Bonanza. So <laughs> the card game Bonanza, I mean, like this has made my top 50 list or my top 100. It's a, it's a card game. It's a simple card game with silly artwork of, you know, the black eye pea or whatever has an actually black eye or you have the green bean you have the wax bean who's, <laughs> you know washing a floor and waxing a floor or and you have all of these and some of them stink bean 
the stink <laughs> bean, you know, like there's the coffee bean that just looks like he's hyper and, you know, it's like, but it's <laughs> such a neat, neat game. So you have in front of you yeah. your field. You can plant two fields and then be like on your turn. And what's really neat is you cannot organize your cards. You get them and you got to play them in order. When your turn comes up, you have to play a card. You can play multiple cards, but you have to play minimum one card. And then, so at, before your turn comes around, it's like, oh my God, I don't want this wax bean because I've planted stink bean and I've planted black eye beans here. Um, so you're trying to trade it off. And you, because if you can't, then you're going to have to harvest one of your field and take that out and plant this because you have to plant. Now, when you harvest, each beans have different values. So, you know, this one could be like, well, once you've reached four bean, it's worth one coin. But if you reach six, it's worth two coins. And if you reach this much, so you, technically you want to try to gain as many of these beans so you can get more coins. Um, and then when you do harvest it, it's like, okay, well, that's worth one coin. So you discard the cards, but you keep the one and you flip it over and on the back, it's the coin. So then you would keep the coin and you keep playing and you play through the deck three times. And it takes quite a while to go through the deck the first time. And it's like, and we do this three times? It's going to be a crazy long game. But it's not because all the coins you're keeping pulls away from the deck. So there's less cards in the deck the next two rounds. And the final round goes so quick that it's like, oh, okay, we're done. It's like, oh my God, I'm not ready. <laughs> you know, so, and then at the end of the game is whoever has the most coins is the winner. Um, and then, but the whole negotiation, cause you got to plant your bean, then you flip two bean, then you got to negotiate if you're going to keep those or trade those off. And if you trade, you have to plant what you trade right away. And it's just, such a well thought out game and this game just works so well i love it and that's my number five bonanza which was published in 1997 so that's an older one that's his first game that's what wow. i on my like on that list that i was yeah i love that game too yeah and these neither of those are on my list for just for the fact that i can't find people to play them with they <laughs> i don't know i just love those games though they're awesome they're great. Uh, my number four is another crossover, and that is Framework. Ah, I love this one as well. It's it's such a cool tiling game. So simple, the best, easiest setup. <laughs> you literally put out three tiles, or I guess maybe depending on player count, and choose one, and you start, and then you build around it. It's it's so I don't know. It's so simple, but yet. It's such a cool game. Again, it has a cool solo, which you are just basically trying to build your, um, or you're trying to get rid of your, your disc, but there's a, a spin to the, the solo mode is that at the end of the game, you are, you have to figure out the biggest square you have built. And then what is ever on the outside is all going to be negative points. So oh, wow. it's a little trickier. <laughs> Because you can't just build willy-nilly all over. You have to try to strategically build in a square. Maybe even a rectangle is okay. I can't remember. I haven't played the solo version for a long time. But such a good game. Yes, that's my number four framework. Nice. Yeah, great choice. My number four is another one of his card games that I absolutely adore. And that's Mamma Mia. Mamma Mia was created in 1999. I've played this one for the first time at uh, my friend Darren's house. Because he would have game nights and then there would always be like a, a big party game we'd play. Then we'd divide up into smaller groups and play these other games. And we ended up playing the Mamma Mia. <clears throat> and it's amazing. So this one is each player will pick a deck or card of a colors so maybe i'll take the yellow cards there's the green cards there's the brown cards and so on so you get your set of cards and then the cards will have different pizza orders and then all like my if i'm yellow all my pizza orders is going to require pineapple because that's my kind of favorite ingredient and then a combination of other ingredients as well and then you have all these ingredient cards you get and then on your turn you can put ingredients into the oven. So you have the middle discard pile that's the oven and everybody adds ingredient into this oven. And you can add one, two, three, four, whatever, as long as it's the same kind. So you'd be like, okay, hey, I'm putting three peppers. So I put three cards of peppers in the oven. 
And then the next player goes like, okay, well, I'm going to put four pepperoni. So they put pepperoni in there. And you're kind of going around until you think there's enough ingredients in the oven to fulfill your pizza order. So then you could be like, okay, I'm putting an order. So you discard the order on top of the ingredients. And then you're going around doing that. <clears throat> At the end of the round, you take the stack, you flip it over, and you start sorting the ingredients as they were, as they were discarded. And then you get an order. It's like, okay, so we got an order. This one was four pepperoni and a pepper. And then you have to discard those ingredients from there. It says, okay, well, those ingredients were available. So this order was fulfilled. So you give that back to the player and they get that as a point. Then you keep discarding the ingredient. Okay, the next order. Okay, this one needed five different ingredients, but we're out of pepperoni. So it's like, oh, I didn't think he had used all the pepperonis. Now, the player who put that order can supplement from their hand. So if they have a pepperoni left in their hand, it could be, yeah, here's pepperoni and fulfill the order. And then they get the point. Otherwise, that order goes back into their unfulfilled orders. And then you keep flipping the ingredients and then see how many orders get done. But then one of them is like, it's like, the works pizza and then it just takes all the ingredients that were in the oven those all go away then you start again i was like oh, how did i miss you played that one and then you have an order and there's like almost no ingredients and then i was like darn it it's like oh, well you need two pepperoni and a pineapple do you have that i was like, no i don't have that <laughs> you know so but it's such an interesting game and this is one that we've played a lot at restaurants while waiting for our food and then we're playing oh, Mamma Mia. Cool. <laughs> um, it's it's just a neat one. The theme is so cute. The artwork, I mean, it's just simple artwork. You have the ingredients. But, like, the whole concept of trying to get your order in and ha hope you have enough ingredients. So it's kind of a bit of a memory game. Um, it's a great game. And that's my number four, It's Mama a Mia. lot of a memory game. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's half luck. Cause For I, me, anyway. Yeah. I don't always remember. So I'm like, well, it seems to me there was a lot of peppers. So I'll put my pepper pizza in and like, hope for the best. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's just a neat game. It's a simple card game, but oh, I love it. So that's my number four, Mamma Mia. Yeah. I, I bought it... Um... Or I got it for Christmas, I think, just recently or around Christmas. Nice. And I was so excited to play it. Played it with um, Cherry and Ashley, and they weren't fans. And I was like, oh no! I <gasps> what want to is play with them and little card games? <laughs> they don't like very many. Cherry more than Ashley, but um, yeah, they don't love the the little card games. Too bad, but. I think I could maybe play this with my family. I think they might like it. I'm going to have to try. Maybe I'll I bring like it out today. I like this a lot, yeah. It's Easter Sunday for us today, so we are... Maybe I can get some some of those little games in. Yeah. It. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, my number three is one of his bigger ones, um, and that's called Hallertau, made in 2020. Now, this is a farming game as well, but very different from his other farming games where you are collecting resources and um, trading them in. I, I mean, I guess you're still doing that, but he uses a different type of board. And it's so it's just like a, a track that you will move your resources up. So you don't have a whole bunch that you will, well, you still, you'll still have more than um, one each because you could have more than what your board holds. So then you'll add another one onto that. But he uses different types of resources in this. There's like wheat, barley. He always uses wheat, but there's barley and tobacco, I think, is in this one. There's different things. But it, there's a lot of card play in this one. So the card play in this is quite unique because some of the cards that you are trying to fulfill will give you income throughout the game. Um there is some luck in drawing the cards because you may have a hand of cards that do not work together at all, but then you will use your worker placement spots to go get more cards. You have this big grid of worker placement spots in front of everyone that you can go to. And what you use as your workers are cubes. Now, how you use the cubes is if nobody is there, you can use one cube or whatever the minimum requirement is. Other people can go to that if there's a spot open, um, below or above it that requires one more cube than you had. So you start with, I think it's 11 
cubes. So you can do quite a few things in um, each round and you can gain more workers with card play or different things. But what you're trying, the main thing you're trying to do is you're trying to move this community building. You all have this community building in front of you and you're trying to slide it over, which is, I'm not sure how the theme in that works, but so how you do that is you have this whole list of different things you can do to slide it over and you have to pay those resources and you also have to remove these boulders so that you can move them and then so there's maybe about six or seven different things and they'll all have to be, you'll have paid, have to paid all of them in order to slide it over one slot. Every time you slide it over, you're going to get more workers each round and more points at the end of the game. I always kind of have the um, strategy of trying to get it to the end gives you a lot of points. I don't think that's the only strategy because you could just move it over a bit and just try and build up different things through card play. Um, some of the cards will give you just points at the end. Some will give you more income. Some will give you just different things or abilities or things like that. But it's another one where the solo game, all you're doing is at the end of the round, removing some cubes from different quadrants so that you can go back into those spots and some will remain so that the next round you can't go to certain spots. It's such a cool game and I haven't played this for so long. I need to get this to the table soon. I might have to pull this out in the next few weeks, but that's my number three, Hallertau. Nice. I haven't played that one either. My number three. Yeah, that one's not talked about a whole lot. Yeah, I haven't heard of it really, so... Okay, yeah. we'll have to kind of keep an eye out for that one. Now, my number three, this is the one for me that would replace Feast of Odin. I'm not going to play Feast of Odin again. Instead, I would play this one. And this is Fields of Arl, uh, created in 2014. Now, this is a one to two player game. So it's, and you know, for a two player game, this is a big game. You got the big board, and then you got like your player boards as well, and it's still farming. It reminds me of Feast of Odin just because of all the different options of where you can go in this worker placement game. But it's interesting because you mm -hmm. play like the spring, summer, and then the fall, winter. So first you have like the first half of the board that you can do these actions and things that you would do. Um, and it's, like I said, farming, you get animals, you, you plant resources and you kind of harvest crops and all this sort of stuff. And then you get your, your winter one and you can go fishing, you can butcher your animals. You can, like, there's all these different things that you can do about like you're running a farm. Um, and then you have your, your player board where you're kind of, you know, putting your animals on and then you're upgrading your, your stuff as well. And I enjoyed this one. I've only played it the one time. I don't own this one yet. I want to. Um, and it was just one that was neat and satisfying to play. Kind of had that, you know, like the same with his farming games. I had that similar feel. But it was interesting with the first half and the second half and all the options you had to do. But it didn't have that dread feel that uh, Feast of Odin did for me. So uh, that's my number three, Fields of Horror coincidence that's my number two. Oh no <laughs> <laughs> i love this game and and i see what you mean by the the reminder of the all the different worker place and spots but it's such a cool game and this one i get lost in time where it's like oh i three hours have gone by and like it's almost <laughs> over but maybe not three two two and a half and it's like oh wow i was just you know so invested in this game there's um an expansion to this game called Tea and Trade that turns it into a three-player game. Oh, I haven't right. got to play that. Did you play that no. when you played it with Michael? No, it was, uh, we played no, it just the, the base, I'm pretty sure. Just the two? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But no, it's an awesome game. And it was really hard to find. I'm sure this one will be remade, but I did finally find this game. Now I am searching for Tea and Trade. Anyone out there has <laughs> expansion let me know please hook carlo up <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah <laughs> all right my number two is two games and i'm putting them together and that's agricola and agricola all creatures big and small now bonanza and bonanza duel i split them up under two different games or uh, two different 
numbers because those play so differently. But I find Agricola and Agricola, all creatures big and small, give me that same feel. You get the big game of Agricola mm-hmm. and you're kind they of going around, similar. you're building your farm, you get your little fences up and you get your animals in there and then it's very satisfying. And then the Agricola, all creatures, big and small, is the exact same game minus most of the cards and just condense in like half hour, 45 minutes. But it gives you that Agricola feel, I find, when you play it. Um and I've like a lot of complaints with this game is the feeding the people and how difficult that is. I've only ever played Agricola two players, and I love it at that player count. And I find it's not as big of an issue getting your people fed because there are options of where no. you can go and they don't get blocked out that easily that you tend to have the option to be able to feed your people. So it's it's never felt like an issue. Um, and you don't feed your people every round. It's like at the end of each section. So most of the time, you've had plenty of time to kind of get yourself set up to be able to do that. Um, but it is neat and satisfying. And what's neat with this one, and then with the previous run, the Field of R, the components. Oh, my God. You get like this little horse-shaped meeple, wooden meeple. Then you get the little cow-shaped one. You get the little pig and the little sheep. You know, like, it's just so satisfying to have these little things you're playing with. Um, I really enjoy this game. I've played this with my son, Jerome. My children do not enjoy playing board games all that much. And then Jerome played Agricola, and he's like, huh, I like this one. And I'm like, what? Like, of all the games that he would play that I would actually say he enjoyed, I didn't think Agricola, the big heavy game would be one of them he's like well yeah it's farming i like farming my boys are farm boys right they grew up on a farm so i was like okay good to know so it was great but that's my number two agricola and then agricola all creatures big and small and i realized that i did not write the year on those ones but those are my number two. Oh, i can look that up agricola was in big and small was 2012 okay and Agricola was 2007. So five years later, he made the, the duel. Game. Nice. That's cool. Yeah. All right. My number one is another crossover. Okay. And this one shocked me that it was number one, um, but that's Nova Luna. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I was surprised it made it to the top, but every time I compared it, I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that one, that one. And it's... I mean, the fact that it's so easy to get to the table, too, is probably a factor. But I just love this one. There's another game he makes called Sagani that is very similar to this. But I still prefer this one. I just love it. Just trying to get the tiles in the right spot and the race aspect of it where it's like, oh, I can see she's got three left and I have four. (laughs) What am I going to do? I have to do something. But it's just so fun. And... um, it's such a cool game. I would play this any time of day. Easy to get to the table. Something you could play outside. It's just awesome. I love it. That's my number one, Nova Luna. Nice. My number one is Le Havre, the Inland Port. Now, in this case, I'm not saying Le Havre and Le Havre, the Inland Port, like I did with Agricola, for the only reason that I have never played Le Havre. And I want to, just because of how much I like this particular one. And I don't know how similar or how it compares, but I love the Inland Port. I was so impressed with it. My bro- It was my brother's game. And he said, here, play this one. Um, it takes us too long. And they didn't enjoy it. So me and Lee ended up playing it. And it didn't take us that long. Or if it did, it didn't feel like it. But you have this rondelle. And you have, like, it's almost like, a clock and you have like the hand that's going to move one space every round and every round there's buildings that comes and are available and you can purchase these buildings and you add them to just behind the hand of the the rondelle and then you're going to flip that over so it's right next to it then the next round it's one away and next round it's two away and as it moves away the more powerful the action of that buildings become and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to wait till it does all this, then I can do all of this, and it's going to be that much more powerful. Um, 
if it ever doesn't get used and the hand reaches it again, you're forced to sell it at half the price. And you don't really want to do that because they are worth victory points at the end of the game. So, But when you activate the building, it resets it and it puts it right back up to where the hand of your rondelle is. What's the real kicker with this is you could be like, okay, I'm saving this building because I'm going to use it next round. It's going to be worth all this much and I'm going to be able to do all of this and it's going to be amazing. And before you get to do that, the other player activates your building on your own rondelle and kind of resets it where it's right next to the hand. It's worth nothing. I'm like, oh my God, I was going to do that. <laughs> it's like, but the benefit of him doing it is you get paid gold, but it it kind of messes up with your own plan. Now, you can totally do that on their <laughs> own rondelle. You can use their building. They can use your building. But be aware of this because if you're not thinking this and just – and they come and mess up with your – like, it, it can be frustrating. But just got to be aware. These aren't your own buildings. Everybody has access to them, so – but they're going to be your points. But – and then you want to make sure as well you use the building so they don't reset. So that's the whole aspect of that game. Now you have the whole resource management aspect of the game, which was amazing. So you have one cube for each resources, and there's three resources in the game. And some of the action that your building will do is kind of increase the resource. And it'd be like, hey, you can move this one up one. Because when you're spending the resources, you can spend and send it to the left and that's spending one or you can send it down and that spends three or down and to the left is spending four so ideally you want to have your resource cube as far uh, right and up as you can because that's going to give you the most resource value and when you spend so if you've actually moved your resource all the way to the left and you got to spend one but you're up against the left you're going to have to spend three and move the cube down and now you're overspending because of how the resource management happened and the placement of these resource cube can be worth points at the end of the game as well and the whole top corner top right corner is is not in place there's no resource available there and that's where it would be worth the most so it's kind of interesting you want to get it up high you can't go right because there's nothing there but being too far left makes you overspend as well so it's just such an interesting resource management that I haven't really come across in any other games and I love it and those two aspects makes this such an interesting game i was so impressed with this when we played it and like i said i haven't played its mother game like le havre and i want to just because of how much i like this two-player version um and i but i'm not sure how much it compares but that's my number one le havre the inland port yes this is such an awesome game and i think you will like the big game there's the a very similarity where um if you like you can use everybody's buildings like that mm -hmm. one but if somebody's on that building then you can't go to it and the thing is someone can sit on that building for a long time and not have to use their worker because there's so many different things you can do that you don't need your worker you oh. only have one worker in the game in the big game right and so you're like i need to like upgrade my resources and I need you to get off that building and they're like eh, I've got so many other things to do here that I'm not <laughs> going to do that so it gets frustrating but it's really cool and the resource I mean they don't use that resource grid in there yeah you have resources that you can collect but it's cool because you these resources will build up into piles on these places because there's so many different things to do that you're like okay, I really want that huge pile of wood, but I got to go get that, the money here. So you like, it's so satisfying because you just go and you collect this giant pile of wood nice. and you put it on your board. And then um, all the resources can be upgraded so they will flip over. And so there's different places to, like that buildings that you can go to, to do that or to multiply them. Like there's different cards of buildings that will be in different games. So never every game is not the same. Some of the buildings are cool. Like I think there's one, it's called a church where it'll turn like one fish into like five fish or something. And then, and so it, it there's like these unique buildings like that. It's, it's really good. 
Yeah. I still, I can't believe it's my number 10, but there's so many games here that... Yeah. Um, yeah, you really got to play that one. It's yeah, good. I want Don't to. Don't play it at a higher player count than three. Yeah. It's, you play it, a it two, it's down. an awesome two-player game. Nice. But it's still different than the his two-player version. So I yeah, love I really, how he's like got it. the big game and the two-player version. And yeah, I yeah, really enjoy those. I do too. Nice. So mm-hmm. that was it then for our top nine U Rosenberg game. Um, I mean, make sure you comment and let us know if any of yours didn't make our list that you think should have been um now before we call it quits carla where can we find you i'm on instagram at board game specialist all one word and i have a facebook page called red deer board game fanatics what about you so we have a discord channel so be sure to check us uh out over there and we'll add the link to the comments as well and i am on instagram as mal's underscore board game underscore room my Facebook page is Mal Board Game Room, and my YouTube channel is Mal's Board Game Room. So be sure to tune in next week to do our top nine better than risk game, which should have been this one, but you know, I, I, I yeah, I messed up. <laughs> so, That's all good. <laughs> um, but thanks so much for tuning in, everybody. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. <laughs>